In this section, we are going to look at an introduction to machine learning, take a tour of the JavaScript machine learning landscape, and we'll be setting up a machine learning environment. In the first video on introduction to machine learning, we are going to look at what is machine learning and what are the different types of machine learning. Let's start with the question, what is machine learning? A computer program is said to learn from experience E with some class of task T and performance measured P. If its performance at task T as measured by P improves with experience E. So what this means is basically that each time the computer program gets an experience, its performance improves and this improvement is over the task T. This statement will become more clear as we go throughout the course. Now you must be hearing some of the popular terms these days like artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning. Let me explain what is the relationship between all these terms. Artificial intelligence is a generic term used to describe a machine or a computer program which work and react like humans. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence which automatically learns and improves from experience like we saw in the previous slide. And deep learning is a subset of machine learning which is a highly connected neural network and we'll understand these in the later part of a section. So in simple terms, Machine learning uses statistical techniques to give computer systems the ability to learn from data. The data comes in, goes into the algorithm, and the model is generated from this learned algorithm. Now let's see some of the types of machine learning algorithms. These types are supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. In the case of supervised learning, we want to tell the algorithm the truth and we do this with the help of certain set of input data as well as the corresponding output data. And over time, the algorithm learns for a given set of input what should be the correct output. We do this as teachers by providing lots of labor training data. And on each iteration of the algorithm, the algorithm learns based on the previous examples. The training data usually consists of inputs, also called as the predictors, and the output variable. This input and output pair is then used to learn a mapping function from the input to the output. And then we can use this mapping to make predictions only on the input data and trying to predict the output data. Let's take this example. Here, we have images of handwritten digits and its corresponding labels. So let's say we have an image of a handwritten zero and we have the corresponding value zero as label. We pass this input to the supervised learning algorithm and it makes prediction based on the input of image of a handwritten digit, what is its corresponding label value? Another example is classifying an email as spam or not spam. The input consists of the email and the label whether it is spam or not spam. We pass this into the supervised learning algorithm and it then makes the prediction if an email is spam or not spam. If this is too much to take in right now, do not worry, as we will go into more details about each of these learning type of machine learning algorithm as we proceed throughout the course. Now let's talk about another type of machine learning algorithms called unsupervised learning. In the case of unsupervised learning, the computer is trained with unlabeled data. So unlike the previous example, here we have the input data, but no corresponding output variable. So these algorithms usually mine for rules or detect patterns or summarize the results for us. 
unsupervised learning can be majorly divided into further two parts of association and clustering. In the case of association, we want to discover rules that hold true for large portions of the data. And in case of clustering, we want to group similar data together. Let's look at this diagram. Here, we start with the unlabeled data. We pass it to the unsupervised learning algorithm and we get rules, patterns or summary of this data. Another popular machine learning technique is called reinforcement learning. Here, we teach a software agent to take certain actions in an environment to maximize some sort of cumulative reward. What this means is, this agent takes a particular action on the environment which is then interpreted by the interpreter which in turn sends a reward to the agent if it has taken the correct action and also changes the state of the agent. In this video, we got an introduction to machine learning and the different types of machine learning. In the next video, we'll go through the JavaScript machine learning landscape and see what are the different tools and opportunities that are there in the JavaScript landscape. Hi, and welcome to the video tour of the JavaScript machine learning landscape. In this video, we are going to look at the advantage of machine learning in JavaScript. We'll be looking at TensorFlow.js, an open source JavaScript library which allows us to use neural networks and other architectures based on neural networks. We'll be looking at machine learning tools, which is a collection of traditional machine learning algorithms as well as some state of the art machine learning algorithms based on top of that. We'll also look at STDLib, which allows us to do exploratory data analysis as well as helps us in visualization. Let's look at some of the advantages of using machine learning in JavaScript. One of the advantage is that we can add machine learning capabilities to any web application. We can build and train models inside the browser itself. And if the load of the machine learning algorithm gets too heavy, we can build and train the models in a Node.js server application. We can even perform fast matrix multiplication using the math.js library, which has optimized most of the matrix multiplication for us. Another advantage is that there are many libraries being added to JavaScript for machine learning. Now let's look at one such library called tensorflow.js. tensorflow.js is an open source library that is the successor of deeplearn.js. The main focus of tensorflow.js is on deep learning tasks. And one of the beauty of using tensorflow.js is that it allows us to run machine learning programs completely in the browser. We can use APIs to define, train, and deploy models. And it supports both WebGL as well as Node.js. And we can take advantage of the Node.js server if the computation load on the browser gets too heavy. Another advantage is that it communicates very easily with the TensorFlow Python environment. So we can import and run pre trained models from TensorFlow. Now let's look at another set of tools called as the machine learning tools. The machine learning tools is a collection of open source tools. It supports a wide range of machine learning tasks like k-means, support vector machines, data processing and regression. And the advantage of using machine learning tools combined with tensorflow.js is that you get the whole spectrum of machine learning algorithms. Since TensorFlow focuses heavily on deep learning tasks, you may not always need them. So in that situation, machine learning tools comes in very handy. And it is designed to be similar to scikit-learn. So if you are switching from scikit-learn to machine learning tools, it will be an easy transition. Another library is stdlib. 
stdlib is also an open source library. It supports scientific and numerical web based machine learning applications. It has a comprehensive set of mathematical and statistical functions. And one of the main advantages that it offers is that it helps in data visualization and exploratory data analysis. In this video, we took a tour of the JavaScript environment. In the next video, we'll be setting up a machine learning environment. Hi and welcome back. In this video on setting up a machine learning environment, we'll be looking at how to install Node.js, which will act as a server. We'll then install TensorFlow.js and MLJS, two really popular and almost comprehensive libraries. We look at how to install Visual Studio Code, a code editor, and then we'll be using the Chrome browser to test all of this. Node.js is an open source JavaScript runtime environment that executes JavaScript code outside of the browser. Now let's start by installing Node.js. We do this by first visiting the Node.js site. Here, it has already detected that I'm on a Linux platform. Maybe in your case, it is a Windows or a Mac platform and it will ideally detect it by itself. I then go ahead and download the most stable version. So I'll go ahead and download the 10.15.1 LTS version and not the latest 11.9.0 version. If you wish, you can choose to download this, but it is prone to have more errors. And this one is the long term support version. So this tends to be more stable. And I'll be using this one throughout the course. Once Node.js is installed, I'll install the parser bundler. The parser bundler helps group separate files in order to reduce the number of HTTP requests that we send between our systems and the server. To install the parser bundler, open your terminal and enter the command npm install hyphen g parcel hyphen bundler. Once you click enter, it starts the installation process. Inside your terminal, enter the command npm install hyphen g parcel hyphen bundler. What this does is, it installs the parcel bundler. Once your parcel bundler is installed, Let's move on to installing the libraries. To install both TensorFlow.js library as well as the machine learning tools libraries, we'll use npm install. In the case of TensorFlow, all the functionality is packed under the TensorFlow.js. So to get all the functionality, you'll have to enter the command npm install TensorFlow forward slash tfjs. Once you have entered npm installed at the rate tensorflow forward slash tfjs, you'll be able to install the tensorflow.js library. In the case of machine learning tools, most of the libraries and the respective algorithms are separate, which means that if you want to use regression, we'll install the regression library. And if you want to use something like random forest, we'll install the random forest library. So let's start with just installing the regression library. To do this, we enter npm install ml regression. npm install ml regression. I'm also installing another library called csv to json, which we might need later on in the course but it is not necessary to install it right away. To write and debug our code, we need to use a code editor. And the Visual Studio Code Editor is a really awesome code editor which is developed by Microsoft and it is available for Windows, Linux and Mac OS. It supports for debugging, embedded Git control, syntax highlighting, intelligent code compilation, snippets, and code refactoring 
makes it really awesome. And the best part, it's completely free. So let's go ahead and install Visual Studio Code. When I visit the Visual Studio Code website, it has already detected that I am on a Linux platform and it is giving me options for Ubuntu or Red Hat. Since I'm on a Ubuntu platform, I download and install this. When your download and installation is complete, Visual Studio Code will look somewhat like this. Over here, I'll go ahead and open my section 1.4. Next, I'll open the terminal inside that folder. So my terminal is at the location MLJS code section 1 underscore 4. Now we need to initialize npm. We do this by entering the command npm init hyphen y. Once that is done, create two files in your section 1 underscore 4 folder. Name the first file index.js and the second file index.html. Now let's open this folder in a Visual Studio code. Here I have two files index.html and index.js. Inside my index.html file, I have the HTML and the body tag, a simple div tag with a header and a script tag, which is indexing, which is indexing index.js. Next, I open index.js. Here, I first start by requiring ML regression. Next, we define the inputs and the output. For each of the input, we have a corresponding output. We then train our model and make prediction for a value of 80. Again, if this is not making sense right now, it is perfectly fine as we look at it in much more details as we progress through the code blooper as we progress through the course. And this is only to understand all my libraries and all my different environment has been set up properly or not. Now head back to the terminal. Inside your terminal, enter parcel index.html. This starts to launch the server at the location localhost 1234. When I open it in my Chrome browser, I get machine learning in JavaScript. Next, click on these three dots, then click on more tools, and then click on developer tools. Here it shows the value 29.4, which is the predicted value for the input variable of 80. Both the input and the output variable was dummy variables. But this is how linear regression works and we'll understand it in much more details in the next section. But for now, if you are getting this value or a similar value, you have set up the environment correctly. If not, please go back and check if you have missed any step. Like we already saw, Chrome browser comes with JavaScript console and allows us to see the output of TensorFlow as well as MLJS libraries outputs. In this video, we saw how to set up an environment. In this section, we are going to look at understanding regression with the help of linear regression. And then we'll see how linear regression works. We'll use linear regression to predict salaries after college. Next, we'll go into logistic regression. We'll use logistic regression to understand the classification problem. Next, we'll see an example of predicting treatment cases using logistic regression. So let's get started. On understand regression with linear regression, we are going to look at what is linear regression and what is a linear model. Linear regression is one of the most basic and most commonly used type of predictive analytics tool. It is so widely used that you will be using it at least. Linear regression is the most basic and very commonly used type of predictive analytics tool. Linear regression also helps us find out if a set of predicted variables does a good job in predicting an output.
So if you have a set of x and y and we use linear regression, we can understand how good is x in predicting the y. Let's try to understand linear regression with the help of an example. Suppose you want to predict the weight of a person based on his height. So what you do is create a data set of different individual heights and the respective weights. Let's say the data set consists of only two people. The first one has a height of 185 and a weight of 241 pounds. The second one has a height of 172 centimeter and a weight of 162 pounds. Similarly, you create a wide range of data set. Now, if there is a new person introduced into the class and you want to predict this person's weight, you can assume that his weight will be somewhere close to 174 and you can predict the weight somewhere to be close to this number. So the first set of data set which has the weight values is called the training data set which has the height and the corresponding weight. We'll use this data set to train our model and then pass it the test data set in which we have the individual heights but not the weights and make prediction for the weights using the test data set. This type of problem is called a regression problem. A way to understand a regression problem is that it is always real valued output. And this is how the model works. You have the training set, you pass it to the learning algorithm and it gives out a hypothesis function which when supplied a new height predicts a certain weight. So our task is to learn this hypothesis function. Let's say our data set looks like this. Here we have the height on the x axis and weight on the y axis. And for a given set of height, these are the corresponding weights. From this graph, we can see that the relation between weight and height is pretty linear. So let's say if we want to predict weight of a person at this point, we can do this. And if you want to predict somewhere, let's say here, we'll assume that it will be somewhere here on the weight scale. So what we do is, we try to fit a line. This line now represents all the points where we can estimate the weight for a given height. And we represent it using the equation of a line b0 plus b1 into x1 or in our case b0 plus b1 into height since height is our x1 or the feature. If the line crosses through the origin we'll have b0 value as 0 and the line is entirely represented by b1 into height. But as you can see this is not the perfect fit because there are few points that the line could have covered if it would have not started at the origin and you are getting a huge distance between certain points and the line. So what this line is basically saying that at a given height where we know what the weight should be, this is the weight that the line is estimating. And it is different from the actual weight at this point. So we get a error represented by this blue line. Next let's say we make the slope of the line zero. So we get a flat line which has huge errors. So our task is to find the perfect fit so that we can reduce these errors between the actual weight and the predicted weight. And to quantify this error, we use the sum of the actual value minus the predicted value. But if we did that, it would have normalized the positive and the negative values. So instead, we take the sum of all the squared errors, which is the actual value minus the predicted value squared. This is also known as a cost function j called as the ordinary least square error. In this video, we got an introduction to a regression problem and also some idea about linear regression. In the next video, we'll see understanding how linear regression works. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi and welcome back.
in this video on understanding how linear regression works. We'll see what is error minimization. We'll see an algorithm for error minimization called as gradient descent. And we'll understand gradient descent intuitively. In the previous video, we saw that we have an error function defined by j equals to sum of square of all the errors. Our task over the course of the training is to minimize this error. And the way we go about this is by changing the parameters using the minimization algorithm and then testing if my cost function is reducing or not. The minimization algorithm that we are using is called as gradient descent. Gradient descent is an optimization algorithm used to find the values of the parameters of a function f that minimizes a cost function j. In simple terms, we are using gradient descent to minimize the cost function and updates the parameter so that the cost function changes and hopefully minimizes. Now let's understand the intuition behind gradient descent. To do that, we'll use these two graphs. These two graphs are based on a code by Peter Rollins. Here, the first graph represents the cost function, and the second graph represents the data between the x and y and how my line is fitting on the data. From mathematics, we know that to get a slope at any point, we can take the derivative at that point. So we first take the slope at this point or the derivative at this point and then as we keep fitting the line, we keep reducing the cost function or you can say that as we keep reducing the cost function, my line gets a better fit and we reduce this cost function with the help of gradient descent. We do this based on the equation x equals to x minus alpha, which is something called as the learning rate into the derivative of the cost function. So let's say we take a derivative at this point. The derivative at that point will be negative. And we'll get x equals to x minus alpha, a positive value into, into negative slope. So we get a positive value of x and x moves in the forward direction. So at different points of the graph, we get different slopes. And since all the slope value on the left side of the minima is going to be a negative value, we keep increasing x till we reach this point. So x equals to x minus the learning rate into a negative value. If we had two variables instead of one, x and y, if we had two variables instead of one, let's say x and y, and the cost was given by z, we could have represented with the help of a contour plot, which is a plot in the form of a cross section of a 3D plot. So each of these circles over here represents a curve on the 3D plot. So you can imagine this as a bowl and this as a cross section of a bowl. And since the circles are becoming more constricted towards the center point, we can say that the depth of the bowl increases towards this point. And similarly, we move from this point to this point by taking the slope on the x-axis as well as the y-axis individually. To understand this in 3D, for two values x and y, this is what the bowl looks like. And if we start at a particular point, our objective is to move towards this minima. And we do this by taking the slope for the x-axis and the y-axis and then updating it simultaneously for x and y using the same equation x equals to x minus the learning rate into 
the slope at a given point x. For that, for y, it will be y equals to y minus alpha, the learning rate, into the slope at that point. In this video, we saw how linear regression works. In the next video, we'll use linear regression to predict salaries after college. So I'll see you in the next video. Hi, and welcome back. In this video on predicting salaries after college using linear regression, we are going to look at the steps in linear regression and then we'll use machine learning toolkit to predict salaries after college using linear regression. Just like in any other machine learning task, our first step is to prepare the training data. Next to test, if our algorithm is performing correctly, we use the test data. So for that, we need to prepare the test data. Next, we decide on the features to be used. Then we decide the hypothesis and the cost function. In our case, the hypothesis is pretty straightforward. That college GPA is predicting the salaries after college. And the cost function is a cost function that we saw in the previous videos which is the sum of squared errors cost function. Next, we decide on the minimization algorithm, which in our case is gradient descent. Then we iterate over the data set while training the model and updating the parameters. We finally make predictions on the test data set. Now let's look at the code in which we are using machine learning toolkit to predict salaries after college. Here. I have opened my section 2.3 in my Visual Studio code, which has two files, index.html and index.js. Let's see what index.html looks like. It has a HTML and a body tag, a div tag with a header predicting salaries after college using linear regression, and another empty div tag with the ID hello. Next, we use a script tag to reference index.js. Now let's see what index.js looks like. Here, we first get the linear regression code using ML regression and the require function. Next, we write using ML regression into the empty div tag. We then define our x train and y train values. There are different ways to import data for the training which we'll see as we progress along the course. Next, we create the model and by passing it X train and Y train, we train it as well and assign it to regression. We then use this variable regression to predict the output for value 80. We see the coefficients beta 0 and beta 1 using the coefficients function and then to print the model in a human readable format, we use two string and supply it with the parameter 3. Now let's see what the output looks like using the Chrome browser. To launch the browser, we enter the command parcel index.html which starts the server. I then open the link to the server which launches my browser. The HTML page looks how it was supposed to look. Next. Let's see the output on the console. This is a predicted value for the value of 80. The two coefficient beta 0 and beta 1 is 683 and 97. And the function in a human readable format is 684 plus beta 1 which is 97.4 into x. So in this video, we use linear regression to predict salaries after college. In the next video, we'll understand what is logistic regression and how it is used in classification in understand classification with logistic regression. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi and welcome back. In this video, understand classification with logistic regression, we are going to look at what is a classification problem? What is a hypothesis function for a classification problem? What is logistic regression? What is the cost function used in a classification problem? And then finally, how we apply gradient descent 
in the case of a classification problem. Let's again try to understand classification with the help of an example. Let's say we want to predict if a given image is that of a dog or a cat. So we, in, we want to identify this image from this image. To do this, we start with the label training data as usual and tell the supervised learning algorithm that this image is that of a dog and this image is that of a cat and let it learn so that over time when we give it a new image, it can predict whether it's a dog or a cat. Similarly, identifying whether an email is spam or not is also a type of a classification problem. The distinct part about classification problem is that the output is always discrete value. So in the case of spam or not spam, it's either one or zero. Let's take another example. Here, we want to predict if a student will get into university or not. Anything below this score disqualifies the student to get into the university and anything above this score is considered a good score to get into that university. If we use something like linear regression, we'll get a straight line, but we will not get the optimal value. We want a line like this, which clearly defines a yes or a no answer. Basically, we want the hypothesis function such that the output is always between one and zero. And that is what we get from logistic regression. The output is always between zero and one. So the hypothesis function let's say is wx in plus b represented by h of x equals to f of w into x plus b where f is equal to 1 by 1 plus e to the power negative t. Here e is an epsilon. The property of using this particular function is that the graph looks like this. And if you notice, it has a very small portion in between and for most of the values is either 0 or 1 and it oscillates between 0 and 1. So if you get the estimated probability that y equals to 1 given x is 70% or 0 0.7, there is 70% chance that the person will get selected. Similarly, if the output is 0 0.8, there is 80% chance that the person will get selected. The cost function is different from the linear regression cost function because what we have noticed that the cost function for logistic regression is not a convex function. So to get a convex function, we use this cost function. Here, when y equal to 1, the equation becomes minus 1 log y dash minus 1 minus 1 log 1 minus y dash which gives the output of minus 1 log y dash. So for an output of y equals to 1, when the y is equal to 1, the cost is 0. And if the output is ze predicted output is 0, when y equals to 1, the cost is really high. Similarly, when y equals to 0, the equation becomes minus 0 into log of y dash, which becomes log 1 minus y dash. Here, if y equals to 0 and the predicted value is also 0, the cost function is low. Otherwise, it becomes really high. In this video, we saw what is a classification problem. In the next video, we'll be using, we'll be classifying clothes using logistic regression. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back. In this video on predicting treatment using logistic regression, we are going to look at the steps in logistic regression, the data set for the problem that we are going to use, and the code that we are going to use to solve the problem. The first few steps in logistic regression is pretty much the same as linear regression. The first step is preparing the data, then preparing the test data, deciding what features to use, deciding the hypothesis and the cost function. Here, the hypothesis has an additional function applied to it, the sigmoid function. And the cost function is what we saw in the previous video. Just like linear regression, the minimization algorithm that we are going to use is gradient descent. Then we iterate over the data set while training the model and then we finally make the predictions. The data set that we are going to use for this video is the 2014 survey that measures attitude towards mental health and frequency of mental health disorders in a tech workplace. The target variable is treatment. Has the person sought treatment for a mental health condition or not? The features that we are going to use 
is whether the person works remotely or not at least 50% of the time does the person have any history of mental health problems in his or her family and what is the gender of that person we are considering binary for ease of computation now let's look at the code on how to solve this problem using logistic regression for this i have opened my folder section 2 underscore 5 where i have two files index.html and index.js inside index.html i have two tags html and body inside the body tag i have the div tag with the header predicting treatment using logistic regression and then we are sourcing the index.js file now let's go to the index.js file we first import the ml matrix library next we create a class called logistic regression two classes since it is a binary classification problem with only 0 and 1 then we create a constructor and pass it different options of number of steps the learning rate and the initial weights we are also passing default values for these variables for number of steps is 500000 the learning rate is this and we are checking if we have any weights or not next we create the train function inside the train function we pass two variables features and target the feature is the feature matrix and the target is a target variable we first initialize the weights with zero values next we repeat the steps for the number of specified steps and this is what we do under each step first we calculate the hypothesis where we do a matrix multiplication of the features and the weights and then we apply the sigmoid function on top of it to update the weight we first calculate the output error signal which is nothing but the difference between the predictions and the target variable next to update the weights we calculate the gradient the gradient is calculated by taking the features matrix and multiplying it with the output signal after transposing it then we add this gradient to the weights so that the weights are updated we do this after multiplying the gradient with the learning rate and next we update the weights for the entire code over here we are creating another function called test scores where we take the features the predictions and apply sigmoid on top of it to return those predictions we create another function called predict which again takes my features and returns the predictions then finally we have another function to json which returns my number of steps the learning rate and the weights we are also creating the sigmoid function which is the sigmoid equation applied to each of the scores the result that we are returning is basically 1 by 1 plus e to the power negative score here we take the training sets x and y which has different values and we also create a new matrix for x and a column vector for y we do the same for test sets next we initialize a variable log reg with logistic regression to classes and call the train method after passing it x and y we then predict the final results and store it in final results for this we use the predict function and pass x text to calculate the accuracy of the model we iterate over the final results and see at how many points the final results were the same as y test and we finally output this result over the console now let's see what our output looks like for this we have to do npm install ml matrix after this is done we can call parcel index.html which starts a server a quick note for this folder i had already done an npm in it as well as created two files index.html and index.js which we saw in visual studio code now let's see the output now let's look at the output here we go to more tools developer tools and then go to the console where it shows 60 which is the accuracy of our model in this video we saw how to use logistic regression to solve our problems in the next couple of videos we will see how to improve our model and what are the ways we can measure the performance in the section on improving models so i'll see you in the next video thank you hi and welcome to section 3 improving models 
In this section, we are going to look at model evaluation, better measures and accuracy, understanding the results and improving the model. In this video on model evaluation, we are going to look at what are parameters and hyperparameters, what is a test set, what is a validation set, and look at a process called K fold cross validation. Let's first talk about parameters and hyperparameters. There are two types of values that are involved during the model learning process. The first one is the set of values that can be learned from the data. Example, the weights and the biases. Another set of values cannot be learned from the data. And this is something the user has to somehow estimate based on different tests, like the learning rate, the number of iterations, the number of features or the kernel used in SVM. We'll talk about kernels in SVM in the next section. So basically hyperparameters are the knobs that we can tweak to get an understanding of the data better. One of the main objective of supervised learning is to make predictions on new data. Let's say this is our initial data and we divide this data into two parts, training data and test data. Now, as we progress along during the course of this learning, we want to estimate the number of features or the learning rate. Let's say for different number of features, this is the training error and the test error that we get. For 10 features, we get a train error of 90 and a test error of 0.91. For 50, we get a train error of 0.30 and test error as 0.4. For 70, we get 0.1 and 0.5. And again at 100, we get a training error which is very close to 0, but the test error is relatively higher. In a real world scenario, the test data should be only used after the model is completely fixed. So, for that case, we use something called as a validation set, which can either be 20% of the remaining training data or we can use something called as k fold cross validation. In k fold cross validation, we use k number of samples from the training data. So just like before, we split the data into two parts, train data and test data. But then, we further split the training data into different parts. Let's say for four fold cross validation, the training data is split into four parts. The first part is taken as a validation set and the remaining part remains as the trained data. In the next step, we again take a new validation set and the remaining parts become the training data. Like this, we repeat the validations, we keep moving the validation set and take different parts of the training data. This way, we can take the entire training data and yet get a good estimate using the validation set. In this video, we saw that we can use validation set to measure our performance. In the next video, we'll see some better measures than accuracy. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back. In this video on better measures than accuracy, we are going to look at classification metrics and regression metrics. These are ways to quantify how good or bad our models are performing. Classification metrics are obviously for classification problems, and regression metrics are for regression problems. One of the measures that we have been seeing so far is called classification accuracy. It is the number of correct predictions as a percentage of all the predictions made. It is suitable only when there are equal number of observations in each class and all the predictions and prediction errors are equally important. Now let me explain that with an example. Imagine if there were 100 patients and 90 of them did not have cancer and 10 unfortunately did. In that scenario, if we said that none of the patient had cancer, we'll still get 90% accuracy. But we'll make a horrible mistake of incorrectly classifying the 10 patients. Another metric we use in that scenario is called a confusion matrix. A confusion matrix is an n cross n matrix where n is the number of classes being predicted. Some of the properties that it has is precision. It is a proportion of positive cases that were correctly identified. 
recalled the proportion of actual positive cases which were correctly identified. Now let's see this in the form of a code. Here I have opened my folder section 3 underscore 2 which has two files index.html and index.js. Index.html just like all the other files has HTML and body tag, a div tag and a header which is also pointing to my index.js file. My index.js file has some of the code from section 2.5 where we first import ML matrix library. Then we build a logistic regression classifier. Here we take two sets of input, the training set and the test set. Here I have reduced the size of the training set and the test set so that I can demonstrate the accuracy as well as the different confusion matrix parameters. This is what the test data looks like. Next, I create a logistic regression with two classes instance and train it using x and y and store the final results in a variable called as final results. To get the accuracy, we loop over the final results and compare each element with the same element in Y test. And each time we get a match, we increase the count of matches by 1. We then output the accuracy as accuracy equals to count by final results into 100. Next, to create my confusion matrix, we need to find out the value for true positive, true negative, false positive and false negative. Where true positive is the number of predicted values that my algorithm got right and which was actually positive values. True negative is the number of negative cases that my algorithm predicted correctly. Similarly, false positive is the number of predicted cases that my algorithm predicted positive but was in fact false or a negative case. Similarly, false negative is the number of cases which my algorithm predicted predicted to be positive but were in fact negative. Now let's see how we find out each of these values. Just like the previous time for accuracy, we iterate over final results. If the final result is equal to Y test, we check if it is equal to 1 or a positive case. If it is positive case, we increase the number of 2 positive by 1. Else, it is a negative case and we increase the number of 2 negative by 1. Similarly, if it is not the same as Y test and it is 1, we increase the number of false positive by 1. And if it is 0, we increase the number of false negative by 1. We then print it out on the console. Next, we find out the precision and recall values. Precision is described as the number of true positive over the total number of positive that my algorithm predicted. So it will be true positive, true positive plus false positive. We also find out the recall which is the number of true positive over true positive plus false negative which is out of all the positive values, actual positive values, how many of them we got right. Now let's see the output on the console. We do parcel.index. Here just like the previous times I have already done an npm init then created my two files index.html and index.js and installed my necessary dependencies like ml matrix so then I hit enter. Here my accuracy is 60. The number of true positive is 4. The number of true negative is 2. The number of false positive is 4. False negative is 0. Therefore my recall is 1 and my precision is 0 0.1. We can also use the confusion matrix class present in mljs library. Here it works in a similar way and you get these values positive predictive value, the true positive count, 
the true negative count, the false positive count, the true positive rate, the true negative rate, and we can also get the accuracy. Next, let's look at the regression matrix. Now let's look at regression matrix. One of the values is mean absolute error and mean square error. Another is R squared error. Mean absolute error is the sum of the absolute differences between the predicted and the actual values. With this, we can understand the magnitude of the error but not the direction. Mean squared error is a squared difference. Blooper. Mean squared error is a squared difference between the predicted and the actual values. The square root of the mean squared error converts it back to the original units. And this is called as the root mean squared error. The R squared error is a proportion of the variance in the dependent variable that is predicted from the independent variable. This value ranges between 0 and 1 where 0 indicates no fit and 1 indicates a perfect fit. In the next video, we'll see what these results mean in understanding the results. Hi and welcome back. In this video on understanding the results, we are going to look at bias, underfitting, variance, overfitting and bias variance trade-off. A model is said to have a high bias when it does not have enough flexibility to learn from the data. A high bias problem occurs if the model is not enough complex. A high bias problem can occur in simple models like linear regression or logistic regression with very few features. Let's take this example. Here we have two curves, this one and this one. Our task is to use a line and separate these two out. If we use a straight line, we'll get a fit like this, which is not a good fit. So this type of situation is called underfitting or high bias. A model is said to have high variance when it is too specific to the learning data. A high variance problem occurs if the model is not able to generalize to the actual scenario. A high variance problem can occur in complex models like support vector machines with lots of features or a complex kernel function. A neural network with many layers or lots of features is also another example where high variance problem can occur. If you look at this diagram over here, the new line is trying to fit the graph so well that it is not able to generalize after a certain point and it is trying to capture each of these points exactly. One of the ways to detect high bias or high variance is through cross validation. As you keep increasing the model complexity, the training error keeps going down, but at some point the validation error will start to increase. This is the optimal point where you have both low variance and low bias. A rule of thumb is that if the model is having high bias, it is good to increase the model complexity. And if the model is having high variance, we can reduce model complexity or add in more data or use regularization, which we will see in the next video. In the next video, we'll look at ways to improve the model in improving the models. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi and welcome back. In this video on improving the models, we are going to look at regularization and feature scaling. Regularization is a technique which helps us prevent overfitting. The way regularization works is that regularization discourages learning a more complex model. To understand regularization better, let's first look at the original cost function, which is the sum of all the squared errors by 2m. Or you can say C0 is equal to sum of all the squared errors by 2m. The new cost function then becomes C0 plus lambda into sum of all the weights squared. What this basically means is that for a higher weights we are penalizing the algorithm and thus increasing its cost. Here lambda is called the regularization parameter. If lambda is zero, we are not penalizing on large weights. And if lambda is large, we are penalizing large weights a lot. When we take the sum of squared 
weights. It is called as ridge regression or L2 norm. Another way to penalize the weights is to take the sum of absolute weights and then multiply it with lambda. This is called as lasso regression or L1 norm. The difference between L1 and L2 norm is that in the case of L1 norm, we can get weights value of 0, whereas in L2 norm, we usually get really small weights, which means L1 norm can also be used in feature selection. L2 norm penalizes large weights of all the parameters equally, so all weights will be penalized equally irrespective of the input size. To make it more effective, we need to perform feature scaling. Let's say this is the output y dash equals to w1 into x1 plus w2 into x2. If y dash is in the millions and the feature x1 with input range 1 to 10 million will have small weights compared to feature x2 with input range 1 to 100. But if we try to infer something using linear regression in such a case, by assessing the weights, it will not mean that the weights for x2 should be regularized more. So we perform feature scaling. Feature scaling also makes our convergence faster. In this section, we saw how to improve our model. In the next section, using support vector machines and random forests for complex problems, we'll use these two algorithms to solve complex problems. Hi and welcome to section 4, using support vector machines and random forest for complex problems. In this section, we are going to take a look at what are support vector machines, using support vector machine kernels to transform problems, an image classifier built using support vector machines, then we'll learn how to make better decisions using something called as decision trees. We'll see another method of combining these decision trees to make better predictions. Finally, we'll predict customer churn using random forests. In this video on what are support vector machines, we are going to see what are support vector machines and see how they work. Support vector machines are another example of supervised learning algorithms that can be used for classification and regression analysis. In the case of support vector machines, the examples are represented as points in space. Let's take this graph for example. Our task is to separate the blue dots from the orange crosses. To do this, we try to divide the points with the hyperplane. Let's suppose this line is a good line that divides these two points. Now imagine there are other two lines A and C along with B. From the lines A, B and C, we select the line which has the maximum distance between the nearest data points, which means that the line B has a maximum distance from X as well as this dot. This distance is also called as a margin. Now let's try to understand how support vector machines work. Let's say we have these collection of points and our task is to separate these out. Even if we have a point on this side of the graph, we'll still get the same straight line, meaning that support vector machines are pretty robust to outliers. In this video, we saw what are support vector machines. In the next video, we'll see how support vector machines work and how to use kernels to transform our problem. Hi, and welcome back. In this video on using SEM kernels to transform problems, we are going to look at non-linear problems, kernels in SVM. Now let's understand what is a non-linear problem. Let's look at this graph. Here, our task is to separate out the first set of points from the second set of points. As it is evident from this graph that there is no line that can separate the two classes in x1, x2 plane. So for this kind of situation, we use kernels. Now let's see what are kernels. We first add a new feature z, where z is equal to x1 squared plus x2 squared. This transforms the original problem of not having a straight line to fit x1 and x2 
to a plane z versus x1 where z can now be separated out from x1 using a straight line when we transform back this line to original plane it maps to a circular boundary the z function that we used of x1 square and x2 square is the kernel we can have many such kernels which will transform our original data into different planes and we can make use of these kernels while solving a problem to get a better fit in this video we saw what are kernels and how they work in the next video we'll see svm javascript code to classify images in image classification using svm hi and welcome back in this video on image classifier using svm we are going to look at the road signs classification problem that we are going to solve and something called as feature descriptors and specifically the histogram of oriented gradients descriptor we'll also implement this process using an svm in javascript we'll make use of kernels and see what my output looks like the problem that we are going to solve is the identification of road signs we have different road signs over here like indirection obligation danger and other signs our task is to identify given an image which of these categories it is the data set that we are using is obtained from this address now our task is of image classification but we cannot use the actual image as an input to our machine learning algorithm for this we have to use either the pixel intensity or some other form so that the image is represented in a form where my algorithm can understand it we have noticed that pixel intensity does not work well for algorithms other than neural network so for this particular case we are going to make use of histogram of oriented gradients feature descriptor this technique basically counts the occurrence of gradient orientation in localized portions of an image which means it takes batches of the image and counts something called as gradient orientation and then makes a histogram of it to get a better understanding of what histogram of oriented gradients or hog features mean you can search this online but for now this much information that it transforms our original image in a feature matrix is sufficient to solve this problem now let's look at the svm code to actually implement image classifier in javascript now let's look at the code here i have opened my section 4 underscore 3 in this folder i start with an npm in it next i open this folder inside my visual studio code here i have a few files i have a folder called data which contains all my images then i have a csv with the test data and another csv with the training data this data is nothing but the file name along with the label the file name and then the label now let's see our index.js code here i start by importing all my necessary libraries an fs library which is going to be used for reading the file from the file system hog features library which is going to use to create my hog descriptors image.js file libsvm which is an improved version of the svm library ml hyphen kernel and a range library next i create a function called options which contains my values for my options for my svm the type of the svm that we are selecting is nu spc for uh, support vector classification next we tell that we are using a pre computed kernel the degree of the kernel is going to be 3 and where shrinking is false which means that at each step we are not shrinking the number of steps next i create my options for my hog the cell size is 4 the block size is 2 the block stride is 1 the number of bends in the histogram is 6 and we are using the l2 norm next we create an empty set of arrays x train y train x test y test k train and x train we are going to use these variables 
to store my X features and Y labels. Then we are going to use Ktrain and Ktest to store my features after applying the HOG descriptor. We start by making an async call to the function load data. Inside load data, we create two functions load training set and load test set. Inside load training data, I read my labels train file. I use file system .read file sync and then convert it to string and split it for each new line. So now my variable lines contain all the lines in the data. We iterate over the length of the lines, which is the number of lines in the data. And for each iteration, we split the line on a semicolon and we store the splitted array in elements. If the size of the elements array is less than 2, we skip that iteration. Then we create a variable file and store the location of the file using the file name. We read that file into image. We scale that image to a size of width 100 and height 100. We then apply the HOG feature descriptors and store the output in a variable called descriptor. We then push the descriptor into the X train array and push the label into a Y train array. Next, we create a new polynomial kernel with a degree 3 with a scale of 1 by the length of X train. Then we apply the kernel on top of X train and store that result in K train variable. Similarly, we have a function load test set. Similarly, we have a function load test set, which does pretty much the same except that it stores the value in ktest and we are reading the labels test.csv file. Once load data is complete, we can now start building a classifier, training it, and then testing for results. We start by initializing the SVM into a variable called classifier. We then train the classifier on K train and Y train. And then we call the function test, where test has a predicted output for all the test data. Next, we are trying to get the accuracy. After that, we print out the accuracy. We also try to calculate the error using the number of misclassification, the actual and the expected value. And for each time, the predicted and the expected value does not match we increase the value for the misclassification count. We finally write this all in a output file called a serialized txt. Now let's see what the output looks like. For this, we go to the original folder and open my terminal. Inside terminal, make sure that you have installed all the necessary libraries that you are importing in the code. So please make sure that you are installing all these libraries, including fs, hog, libsvm, image, ml kernel, and other library. Once that is done, you enter the command node index.js. It takes some time to train. And once the training is done, it will move on to predicting the output. From this, we can see that the test size is equal to 50 and the accuracy has come out to be 100. As we have learned in the previous section, that if we get an accuracy that good, there's a very high chance that we are overfitting. So I'll encourage you to try different things and see if we are overfitting or not. In this video, we saw how to use SVM to build an image classifier. In the next video, we'll see ways for making better decision with decision trees. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back. In this video on making better decisions with decision trees, we are going to look at what is a decision tree? Example of a decision tree. Why are we going to use decision trees? Something called a splitting, gainy index, and information gain. Now let's start. A decision tree is a way to make decisions using a tree like graph of decisions and their possible consequences. This is what a decision tree looks like. Here we have the root node followed by two decision nodes, and the end nodes are called leaf nodes. Our job while creating the decision tree 
is to split the data into smaller homogeneous subsets based on the decision at the decision node. Let's better understand this with an example. Let's say in a room of 50 people, 30 are senior programmers and 20 are junior programmers. 27 senior programmers have more than 5 years of experience and 19 senior programmers and 5 junior programmers have a college degree. We want to create a model to predict if a person selected at random is a senior programmer or not. To do this, we split the node to get a homogeneous set. There are two ways to split the data. One, based on the years of experience. Here, if we split the data based on the number of years of experience, we start with 50 programmers and the split criteria of number of years of experience greater than 5. We get a split of 27 and 23. We notice that out of the 27 programmers who have more than 5 years of experience, all 27 of them are senior programmers. And out of 23 programmers who have less than 5 years of experience, only 3 are senior programmers. The other criteria is to split the data based on the college degree. Here, if we split the data based on college degree, we get a split of 24 and 26. Out of the 24, only 19 are senior programmers and 5 are not. And out of 26, 11 are senior programmers and 15 of them are not. Therefore, we split the data based on the number of years of experience as it seems to be a better performer. Since we get a completely homogeneous set, if we split the data based on the number of years of experience, we can further split this data based on the college degree. Now let's go into the details of actually splitting the node. This process is called splitting. The objective to split the node is that we want to increase the homogeneity of the subnodes. There are different algorithms to decide to split a node into two or more subnodes. Some of the algorithms that are commonly used in splitting the data are Gini index and information gain. Now let's understand Gini index. Gini index is a value which indicates the level of homogeneity. The higher the homogeneity, the higher will the Gini index be. To calculate the Gini index for a node, we use the formula of sum of square of probabilities for success and failure. This is the formula over here, where P represents the probability of success and Q represents the probability of failure. And the Gini value for the split is the sum of Gini values for the subnodes. Let's try to understand the Gini index with the help of the previous example. Where we had 50 programmers and we wanted to, to select a senior programmer at random. And we had two choices to split the node. One was the number of years of experience and the second one was a college degree. Let's say we split the node based on the college degree. Here, the Gini index for this subnode will be 19 by 24 squared plus 5 by 24 squared. This turns out to be 0 0.67. Next, Gini index for the subnode without the degree is 11 by 26 squared plus 15 by 26 squared, which turns out to be 0 0.51. So the Gini index for the split becomes 24 by 50 into 0 0.67 plus 26 by 50 into 0 0.51 giving the result of 0 0.586. Now let's do the entire process for the number of years of experience. Here, for the subnode where the years of experience is greater than 5, we get the Gini index as 0 plus 1 into 1, which turns out to be 1. The Gini index for the subnode where the number of years of experience is less than 5 turns out to be 0 0.13 squared plus 0 0.87 squared, which is 0 0.774. So the Gini index for the split becomes 27 by 50 into 1 plus 23 by 50 into 0 
which is equal to 0.896. As stated earlier, we choose the one with the higher Gini index. So, we split on the number of years of experience as it has the higher Gini index. Now, let's look at the same problem from the perspective of information gain. In the case of information gain, we want to reduce impurity and impurity can be represented with the help of entropy. Information gain is based on the decrease in entropy as we go down the tree. So, if there is a decrease in the entropy from the root node to the sub node, we consider it as an information gain. And our job is to maximize the information gain. We calculate the entropy using the formula minus p log p minus q log q, where p and q represents the probability of success and failure, just like Gini index. So the entropy for subnode, where number of years of experience is greater than 5, is equal to 0 minus 1 log 1. And entropy for subnode, when number of years of experience is less than 5, is minus 3 by 23 log 3 by 23 minus 20 by 23 log 20 by 23. So the entropy for the split becomes entropy for the subnode where experience is greater than 5 plus entropy for the subnode where the number of years of experience is less than 5. So the information gain becomes entropy at the root node minus entropy after the split. And if you compare the information gain for the college degree, you realize that the information gain for the number of years of experience is greater than that for the information gain for the college degree. So, once again, we split on the number of years of experience. In this video, we saw what are decision trees and how they work. In the next video, we'll look at a technique of combining decision trees to make better predictions. So, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi and welcome back. In this video on combining decision trees to make better predictions, we are going to look at a way to combine decision trees called as ensemble learning. We'll also look at another very popular technique called as random forest. Let's understand what is ensemble learning. In ensemble learning, we combine the results from multiple learners which are trained to solve the same problem. For ensemble learning, we try to learn more than one hypothesis. This is a traditional look of a machine learning process that we have been seeing so far that we start with the training set, feed it into the learning algorithm and it generates a hypothesis. In the case of ensemble learning, one of the ways to learn different hypotheses is to take different subsets of the training data. So we'll have a training set 1, training set 2, training set 3 and training set 4. And each of them will go into the learning algorithm which may or may not be the same learning algorithm. Like this one could be an SVM, this one could be a decision tree and this one could be a logistic regression model. And each of them generates a different hypothesis. The random forest technique is an example of an ensemble learning technique which uses many trees and makes a prediction by averaging the predictions of each component tree. One of the advantages of random forest, random forest is robust and it is not affected much by outliers and overfitting as well as missing data. Another advantage of random forest is that it works for both classification and regression problems. It can also be used for feature selection as it outputs the relative importance of each feature. One of the major advantages of random forest is that it can handle unbalanced data. An unbalanced data is where the number of cases for one class is more than the other. In this video we saw what are random forests. In the next video, we are going to look at predicting customer churn using random forests. So, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.
Hi and welcome back. In this video on predicting customer churn using random forests, we are going to look at the problem that we are going to solve at the random forest code in JavaScript that we are going to use. Let's see the problem. Customer, customer iteration, also known as customer churn, is the loss of clients or customers. Our objective is to assess the customers who are more at risk of churning. The data set is the data set of customer churn from a telecom industry. And the features include number of voicemails sent by the customer, number of calls made in a day, and number of calls made at the night, and different search features. The last column of the CSV file indicates if the customer churns or not. Here, I have opened my folder section 4 underscore 6 and I have already installed these libraries which include fs for the file system, the ml random forest library and the ml card library. From ml random forest, I am importing random forest classifier and from ml card, I am importing decision tree classifier and storing it in the variables rf classifier and dt classifier. We are using both random forest and decision tree classifiers so that we can compare the results. Next, I create different set of empty arrays to store my x train features, y train label, x test features, and y test labels. Next, I create a variable called options to store the values for options for my random forest. These include an initial seed of 3. Max features of 0 0.8. Here replacement is true, meaning that while iterating, we are replacing the data. And the number of estimators is equal to 25. The options for decision tree is that the gain function we are using is guinea. The maximum depth of the decision tree allowed is 10. And the minimum number of samples is 3. Next, I create a function to load my data called as load data. Here, I have two functions, load training set and load test set. Inside my load training set, I open the file churn train csv dot csv and store it in the variable lines. Next, we are taking the first thousand rows from this variable and we are using it as a training data set. We further split lines based on the comma so that we can read the csv data. We call the map number function so that it converts my string of numbers into numbers. Since we know the last element is the label data, we pop it and store it in y train and use rest of the data as my features. I do similar steps for test data set. Here, I open the file churn test csv, I iterate over the number of lines, store the label value in y test and the features in x test. Next, once my load is done, I do the following steps. I initialize a random forest classifier. I train the classifier using x train and y train and make predictions on x test and store the result in the variable result. Next, I iterate over the results, compare it with y test, and for each match, I am increasing the count of matches so that I can calculate my accuracy, which I do by dividing my count by the length of result and multiplying it by 100 and then I output it on the console. Next, I do the same steps for my decision tree. I initialize my decision tree, train it using x train and y train, make predictions and store it in dt result. I iterate over it and calculate the accuracy and print it out on the console. Now let's run this code. Here, I have opened my folder section 4 underscore 6. I have already done an npm init and installed all my necessary libraries. Now let's run the code. It is taking some time to learn the algorithm and then it finally outputs 89 and 94. The accuracy for random forest turns out to be 89 and for decision tree it's 94. This was the random parameters that I started the algorithm with and got these results. It is likely that if you tweak the parameters, 
the output for the random forest will be higher than the accuracy for the decision tree. So I'll encourage you to try different parameters, use cross validation and see what results suit you. In this video we saw how to use random forest to predict customer churn. In the next section, we'll dive into unsupervised learning in finding hidden values in unlabeled data. So I'll see you in the next section. Hi and welcome to section 5, finding hidden value in unlabeled data. In this section, we are going to get an introduction to unsupervised learning and see some of its advantages. We'll then learn how to use a clustering technique to group unlabeled data in meaningful ways. We'll learn about another unsupervised learning technique called as principal component analysis, which we can use in dimensionality deduction, which in turn speeds up the machine learning algorithms. Finally, we'll analyze plant species using k-means clustering algorithm and look at how to use k-means clustering in a JavaScript environment. In this video on introduction and advantage of unsupervised learning, we are first going to understand what is unsupervised learning and look at some examples of unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is the machine learning task of finding patterns and structures in unlabeled data. Let's take this example. Here, we have this unlabeled data and we want to find out some pattern or structure in this data. So we feed it into our unsupervised learning algorithm. It gives out this grouping of data where we have the shapes on one side and the arrows on the other. This is just one example. Another cases of unsupervised learning can be in customer segmentation, in network analysis, and other unsupervised learning tasks. Let's take this another example. Unsupervised learning is a machine learning task of finding patterns and structures in unlabeled data. Here, we have two values x1 and x2, and we do not have any given structure to this data. But we can see from this graph over here that it can divide it between this and this subgroups. Some of the other examples is we use clustering techniques to cluster different plants or animals together to describe and to make comparisons. It is also used to create groups of plants that share a number of attributes. It is also used in customer segmentation, for example, in targeted marketing, where we want to target frequent spending billionaires versus bulk spending baby boomers. In this video, we saw what is unsupervised learning and look at some of the examples of unsupervised learning. In the next video on grouping unlabeled data in meaningful ways, we'll look at k-means clustering. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi and welcome back. In this video on grouping unlabeled data in meaningful ways using k-means clustering, we are going to look at how does clustering work how does k-means clustering work and a method to determine the number of clusters called as elbow method. Now let's understand how does clustering work. Let's look at this graph. Here we can clearly see that there are two sets of data that we can divide. So for clustering, we start with k points on random and call them centroids. For this example, let's take two points. We randomly initialize this point and this point to be the centroid. Next, we assign all the points close to these points into the first cluster and the points that were close to the second point into the second cluster. Next, we take the mean of all the points in that cluster and move the centroid to the new mean value. We then reassign different points according to the distance from the new centroid location. Now this point belongs to this cluster and these points belong to the new this cluster. We once again take the mean of all the points in that cluster and move the centroid to the new mean value. Now let's see how k-means clustering works. The algorithm goes like this. We first randomly select points in the data and initialize as k cluster centroids. For each data point, we assign the data point to the closest centroid based on the square distance between the points. For each centroid, we find out the mean of all the data points in that cluster and assign it to the centroid. We repeat the last two steps till we 
Dietsch convergence. For clustering, we can say that the cost function is the sum of square distance from the points to the respective centroids. And our objective is to reduce this cost function. So if we start from this scenario, where we have the centroid over here, and the different points in that cluster are over here and here, we start from a very high cost. We take out this distance, and this distance, and all the remaining distance, and find out the cost. Our objective is to minimize the cost. The cost now becomes C equals to C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus C4, where each C1, C2, C3, C4 is the sum of square distance. To minimize the cost, if we move the centroid closer to these points, C becomes small. We initially saw that if we randomly select two points, we can get a good cluster. But this may not always be true. This seems true for this point that if we select these two as centroids, we can get a good cluster. But what if we select these two points as the centroid? At best, it will take a lot of time to reach convergence, and at worst case scenario, it might even select a local minima. One of the ways to handle this is to run multiple instances of k-means and then select the initial cluster centroid which gave the smallest cost. Another technique is to use k-means++. In k-means++, we select a point from the dataset and then select the point farthest away from that point. Alright, so we saw how clustering works and how k-means clustering works and how we can select different points and different clusters. But till now, we don't know what will be the optimal number of clusters that we should be looking for in the unlabeled data. So for that, we use a technique called as the elbow method. Now let's understand how elbow method works. We first run k-means clustering on the data set for a range of values of k. And for each value of k, we calculate the cost. We plot this value on a graph and observe the graph for an elbow shape. We plot this value on a graph and observe the graph. So for different k values, we get a different value for the cost. And it is kind of obvious that if I keep increasing my k, my cost will reduce since if we had the same number of clusters as the number of points in the data set, we'll get a cost of zero. So we want to have the number of clusters such that it is simplified as well as a good representation of the data. Here we can see that it is forming an elbow at the point 3. We, can, we could have also selected point 4. And in such scenario, it is usually the business decision that makes the difference. In this video, we saw how k-means work and how to select an optimal number of cluster values. In the next video, we learn about principal component analysis in using principal component analysis to speed up machine learning algorithm. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi and welcome back. In this video on using principal component analysis to speed up machine learning algorithms, we are going to look at another unsupervised learning technique called as principal component analysis. First, we'll start by understanding the idea behind principal component analysis. We'll see how principal component analysis works and then see an application of principal component analysis in dimensionality reduction. Let's understand the idea behind principal component analysis. Principal component analysis, also called as PCA, is used to reduce the dimensionality of a data set while retaining the information present in the data set. We do this by transforming the variable to a new set of variables. These new set of variables are called as principal components. It is ordered in the order of the maximum to the least information given by the principal components. So the first principal component retains the maximum information, the second, the second highest number of information, and so on. Principal components can also be considered as a direction where there is the most variance. Let's understand this with the help of a diagram. Let's say these are points on a graph. Here we start with a straight line that looks like this. And we try to project all these points onto the straight line. Now if we compare the variance on this line with the variance on this line, we can see that the variance on the horizontal line 
when we project the points onto it is more than when compared to the vertical line. So we say the in the horizontal direction has more information. But we don't need to plot a graph each time we want to find out the principal components. We can do this with the help of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. An eigenvector is a direction. So in the case of the straight line, the eigenvector was the horizontal line. The eigenvalue tells us how much variance there is in the data in that direction. So in the case of the vertical line, the eigenvalue was less when compared to the case where we had a horizontal line. The eigenvector with the highest eigenvalue is the principal component. So the, in the previous example, the principal component was the horizontal straight line. The number of eigenvectors and eigenvalues is equal to the number of dimensions in the data set. So in the previous example, it was a 2D data with two information x and y. So in that case, the number of eigenvectors and eigenvalues was equal to 2. Let's look at the same example. Here, we have the horizontal straight line and the vertical straight line. If you look at it now, they can represent the new axis of the data. So the eigenvectors act as new axes. These new axes are where there is more variance and therefore more information. It may not be the horizontal and vertical axes. And if let's say this oval shape was in this particular direction, the horizontal straight line would have been pointing in that direction. Now let's see how principal component analysis helps us reduce the dimensions of the data. Let's say we had a 3D graph. The gray dots represent on the 2D axis and the orange dots represent data on the Z axis. So now we have this data and this data in the backward direction. If we try to project it on top of the Z axis, we won't get a high value. So we can either ignore this if we are okay with three dimensions. So we can ignore this since the value of this eigenvalue is not much. And thus, we select the first two principal components which has higher values than the third one. In this video, we saw how principal component analysis works. In the next video, we'll be using k-means in analyzing plant species using k-means clustering. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi and welcome back. In this video on analyzing plant species using k-means clustering, we are going to look at the problem that we are going to solve and how k-means clustering works. The problem at hand is to cluster different sets of plant species. We'll be using the iris dataset and the dataset is of plant species. We have to classify based on the petal length, petal width, sepal length and sepal width. For this analysis, we'll be only using petal length and petal width. The dataset consists of 50 samples for each of the three species. So we already know the number of clusters is equal to 3. And we have to group them into three parts. Now let's look at the k-means code and see how it can help us in clustering these plant species. Here, I have opened my section 5 underscore 4 folder. I start by importing my iris dataset. Then I import my k-means clustering algorithm. Next, I get the values for the dataset. Next, I removed the last two variables from the dataset since we are only using the first two. Now we are using k-means clustering by supplying it the value, the number of clusters and an initial seed. By default, it uses the k-means plus plus algorithm and we print out the number of iterations and the centroid along with the error. So now let's see what the output looks like. We navigate to the given folder section 5 underscore 4 and do an npm init. Next, we install the k-means clustering library and the ml dataset iris library. Next, I do a node index.js. This is the output for my k-means plus plus algorithm. These are my centroid values and this is my error. And as we move along, the error keeps on reducing. Now we again run k-means clustering algorithm this time with the initialization technique of most distant. 
and we print out the same values, the number of iterations and the centroid along with the error. And finally, we also run k-means clustering again with our initialization of random and an initial seed of 10 and we print out the output. For the most distant, this is my centroid values and for random, these are my centroid values and this is my error value. Since we already know the number of clusters in this exercise, we don't have to use the elbow method. But if the number of clusters was not unknown, we would have to use the elbow method. In this video, we saw how to use k-means clustering to cluster different plant species together. In the next section, we'll be going into neural networks in deep neural networks. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi and welcome back. In this section on deep neural networks, we are going to look at an introduction to neural networks. We'll see how a neural network works. Then we'll get an introduction to TensorFlow and build neural networks in TensorFlow. Finally, we'll build a multi-class classification classifier using TensorFlow. In this video on introduction to neural networks, we are going to look at what is a neural network and we'll learn about something called a feed-forward neural network architecture. This diagram over here represents a neural network. Some of the parts of a neural network is the input layer, the hidden layer and the output layer. The neural network takes input from the input layer and makes predictions from the output layer. The hidden layer performs computations. Since the hidden layer is not directly involved with the input or the output and it is not directly visible to the user, it is called the hidden layer. The data comes in from the input layer. It then goes to the hidden layer where, there's, where there are some computations on top of the data. And finally, it goes into the output layer, which again has some computations and makes a final prediction. When a neural network has more than one hidden layers, it is called a deep neural network. Ideally, a deep neural network will have more than two to three hidden layers. This architecture in which the data flows from the input to the hidden layer and then to the output layer is called a feed-forward neural network architecture. In this video, we got an introduction to neural networks. In the next video, we'll see how a neural network works. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi and welcome back. In this video on how a neural network works, we are going to look at the basic building block of a neural network called as neuron. We'll see how the neural network outputs its output. We'll see the cost function involved in a neural network architecture. We'll look at the gradient and we'll look at the technique called as backpropagation which allows the neural network to learn. A neuron is the functional unit of a neural network. This is the architecture we saw in the previous video as well, where we have the input layer, the hidden layer and the output layer. These nodes over here are called as the neurons. This neuron, let's say, gets two input, x1 and x2. It does some operation on top of it and outputs f of h. Let's say, we also have two weights w1 and w2. In that case, my h is my x1 w1 plus x2 w2 and f of h is the sigmoid of h where sigmoid is my sigmoid activation function. By activation function, I only mean the output will have to go through the sigmoid function. You can also say that each of these neurons are performing logistic regression because we get the hypothesis as beta 0 plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 plus bn xn plus b which is equal to w into x plus b and the hypothesis is given by h of x is equal to f of w into x plus b and then we apply the sigmoid function on top of it. Now let's see how the weight and the input is used to get the output. Let's say we have two weights x1, x2 and two weights w11 and w21 representing the weight going from x1 to the first node and x2 to the first node. Here the first hypothesis represented by h1 is equal to x1 w11 plus x2 w21 
and the output from this node will be sigmoid of h1. Similarly, for the node 2, the output will be calculated on top of h, where h2 is equal to x1 w12 plus x2 w22, where w12 and w22 is the weight coming from x1 to the second node and x2 to the second node. Similarly, we calculate the output from the third hidden layer node. Now, the output from the hidden layer acts as the input to the output layer. So, the h for the output node is equal to the output from the first hidden layer multiplied by weight plus the output from the second hidden layer multiplied with the weight plus the output from the third hidden layer multiplied with the weight. And the final output from the output layer is given by applying the sigmoid function on top of it. This step of propagating the input from the input layer to the hidden layer and then to the output layer is called as forward propagation. Now let's look at the cost function for a neural network. The cost function for a neural network is the same as logistic regression. To minimize the cost, we use gradient descent. During gradient descent, we update the weights. B1 or W1 is equal to B1 minus the learning rate into the derivative of J of B1, which is the new weight is equal to the old weight minus the learning rate into the derivative of the cost function with respect to the weights, where the derivative of the cost with respect to the weight is the change of the cost with small change in the weights. But let's say we want to update the weight for this node. We want to update W11 and W21. To update this weight, we need to find out the change in the cost with respect to the change in W11 and W21. To do this, we have to back propagate the cost from the output layer to the hidden layer. This step of moving the cost from the output layer to the hidden layer so that we can update our weights is called as backpropagation. Backpropagation is a technique where the error is calculated at the output and distributed back through the network. The error term delta is the derivative of the cost function, which we are going to use during the backpropagation step. We start with the error term delta at the output layer and move it backwards to the hidden layer. To understand the error term at the hidden layer intuitively, the derivative of the cost function will depend on the weights between the two layers and the output going from the node. So the weight and the output going from the node. So the error term over here is given by W1 into the error term at the output multiply with the derivative of the output coming from the hidden layer. To understand the backpropagation algorithm, it works like this. For each input data, we do a forward pass calculating the output at each layer. We calculate the cost at the output layer. We propagate the derivative of the cost function backwards using backpropagation. We update the weights based on the value of the error term. In this video, we saw how a neural network works. In the next video, we learn about TensorFlow in neural networks in TensorFlow.js. Hi, and welcome back. In this video on neural networks in TensorFlow.js, we'll understand what is TensorFlow.js and look at the sum of the fundamentals of TensorFlow.js. TensorFlow.js is a JavaScript library. Using TensorFlow.js, we can add machine learning capabilities to any web application. We can build and train models in the browser, as well as build and train models in a Node.js server. TensorFlow.js has a lot of capabilities for neural networks, and it is supported by Google as well. Let's see some of the fundamentals of TensorFlow.js. Some of the fundamentals are tensors, operations, and models or layers. Tensor is the data unit inside TensorFlow.js. 
so the data set is usually represented in the form of a tensor. A tensor is an n-dimensional vector. A tensor can be used to represent n-dimensional data set. So if you want to represent a data of dimension 4, we can have a tensor like this. Or if you want to represent a data of dimension 4 cross 3, we have a tensor like this. And similarly, if you want to create a tensor of dimension 2 cross 3 cross 3, we can have a tensor like this by defining it like this. Operations are used to manipulate data of a tensor. Each time we make use of an operation, a new tensor is created. Operations include Square, addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Another important concept in TensorFlow.js is that of models or layers. In TensorFlow.js, model is the buildup of one or more layers. We can use and combine different types of layers while creating a model. Now let's see a sample code to understand TensorFlow.js better. Here. I have opened my folder section 6 underscore 3 where I have my files index.html and index.js. My index.html is pretty straightforward with HTML and body tag, one container tag, and one script tag referencing my index.js file. Inside index.js, I import tensorflow.js. Then I create something called as a sequential model. A feed-forward neural network is an example of a sequential model. We add a single layer to this sequential model by using tf.layers.dense, meaning a fully connected neural network layer. Since the number of units is 1 and the input shape is also 1 and there is only one layer, this can also represent a linear regression model. Next, we compile the model by passing it the loss function as mean squared error and the optimizer as stochastic gradient descent. We then supply it with the input as height and weight using tf.tensor2d. Next, we use model.fit to train the model for 500 iterations and once that is done, we print out our predictions. Now let's see what the output looks like on the console. To run my code, I do parcel index.html which launches my server. I navigate to this page and open the console. At the console, we have the output 76.40 which is the desired output. In this video, we learned about tensorflow.js. In the next video, on multi-class classification using tensorflow.js, we'll be using tensorflow.js to build a multi-class classifier. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Hi and welcome back. In this video on multi-class classification using tensorflow.js, we are going to look at the problem of digit classification and then we'll build a simple neural network for image classification. We'll be using the MNIST dataset. The MNIST dataset is of handwritten digits and our task is to classify the images of digits into respective digits. Since the range of digits is 0 to 9, it is a multi-class classification problem. This is what the image looks like, which is 28 cross 28, giving us a total of 784 features. We are going to use that 784 features as our input features, pass it to a set of hidden layer units, and pass it to the output layer, which has 10 units, one for each of the digits. Now let's look at the code. Here I have opened my folder section 6 underscore 4. It has many different files. The data.js file is going to help us import the data. The index.js file gets all the functioning together and our main file is model.js where we write the actual code. So we start as usual by importing the tensorflow.js library. Next we define the hyperparameters where learning rate is equal to 0.1, the batch size is 64, and the training steps is equal to 100. The image size is 28, the label size is 10, and the optimizer we are going to use is stochastic gradient descent.
the number of input neurons is 784 the number of hidden neurons is 392 and the number of output neurons is 10 corresponding to the 10 digits next we create variables that we want to optimize which is basically the weights leading from the hidden layer to the output layer the bias on the hidden layer and the bias on the output layer to create the weights from the input layer to the hidden layer we do tf.variable, tf.randomnormal and pass it the input neuron size and the hidden neuron size. To create the weights from the hidden layer to the output layer, we pass it the hidden neuron size and the output neuron size. To create the bias, we pass it the same number of hidden neurons. And for the bias to the output, we pass it the number of output neurons. Next, we define a loss function as softmax cross entropy. Next, let's create a model. Here, the input is XS, which is input as 2D, and then we give it a size of path size, input size, cross input size. Next, we create the first hidden layer, where we take the inputs, multiply it with the weight to the hidden layer, and add the bias and return it. We create another layer where we take the weights from the hidden layer to the output layer, multiply it with the output from layer 1 and add the bias and return it. Next we train the model. Here we take the data, we repeat the number of steps for the train steps, we find out the cost and we minimize it and in each iteration we return the loss for the batch size and from the batch we take out the labels and the features. Next we write a prediction function where we basically return the model and the argmax over the axis 1 which is it returns the value which has the highest probability. In the case of digits it will return the digit which has the highest probability. Now let's look at the output and this is what the output looks like. We get an accuracy of 86% and the test sample that we sent to the algorithm and the prediction for each of these. Thanks a lot for joining me for this course. I hope you enjoyed it.